We're on the air. OK. Uh, Jay, thanks for uh, agreeing to be a speaker here today. It's been a while since we've spoken, and uh, it's good to see you. Uh, Jay. Good to see you. Jay was the former state geologist of Pennsylvania. He was instrumental in creating the LIDAR that most of us use for our jobs. Uh, P-A-S-E-I-S, -E which I don't know really what it is, but I'm pretty sure you're also responsible for pen pilot or a large part <laughs> of pen pilot, which is one of my favorites. Uh, I, Jay and I are former colleagues from Ari Wright, and I know he just wanted to get those aerial photos from the state archives and and we see them on pen pilot. Uh, he brought the, uh, as a state geologist, he brought the uh, survey into the modern age with GIS. Uh, that was because he worked at the, uh, he brought also Lancaster County into GIS uh, when he left Ari Wright. Uh, he has a doctorate in geophysics from Penn State. He worked at, for Ball Aerospace at NASA. Mobile and uh, the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, Mobile Oil Company, and as I mentioned, Lancaster County GIS Department. And then after uh, that, Penn State University, Bowling Green State University, and a small short stint, I guess, at the Harrisburg University, and also uh, an advocate for science at the PADEP. Uh, where I guess he spent some time mapping uh, methane, I believe, releases and remote. He he uh, advised on remote sensing technologies. Uh, when he was with us at RE Raid, he got us into Indian Echo Caverns for free, unescorted for two <laughs> weekends. And uh, he also... Uh, Got us into Booby's Brewery for free uh, <laughs> after mapping the Christiana Riot House uh, with geophysics. Uh, at RE Wright, he was in charge of the Learning Center and imagery and a lot of cool stuff. So Jay, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on and uh, telling us about the geology at a place I can't pronounce in Brazil. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that introduction. <laughs> that was quite a walk down memory lane. Uh, hey, Jay, do you want let to me see if I can do this right? Yeah. You now remember, you got to turn off your camera and then share your screen. And my screen. all right, you did it. First try. Good job. All right. So this is the geology and history of Pata dos Guimarães region of Mato Grosso, Brazil. Uh, what you see in front of you is a waterfall that we're going to see many times because it's the probably the most picturesque waterfall. It's called the Vale de Nueva or the uh, Bridal Vale Falls. Uh, it's about 225 feet uh, high. And so obviously none of us probably had a, a, a the geology of Brazil in any of our um, uh, educations as undergrads, uh, unless you went into it specifically in, in graduate school. So my first step was to find where I was. Uh, here, here's Brazil. Um, where we're looking is near Cuiabá, which is this city over here. And you've been hearing about Brasilia because that's where the, uh, the, the almost takeover happened a few weeks ago. Uh, and Rio de Janeiro is down here and Sao Paulo is here. Basically, Rio and Sao, Sao Paulo are the two big cities that are thing in, this, in the country. Uh, they say that Rio is where you go to have fun and Sao Paulo is where you go to make money. Um, so the first thing I did was I found a, a geognostic map from 1950, and I had never heard 
part of a geognostic map. Uh, essentially, it's just another word for geology and the terminology is no longer used. So I thought I'd throw it in here because I mean, you never heard of it either, but I, I certainly never had. Um, so I, it was pretty cool to see a whole different, I was waiting to see if it had some really bizarre our information on it, but it's basically just geology. And what you can see is that the, the, the shield for Brazil is bisected by the Amazon basin alluvium uh, and a few um, basins, sedimentary basins. And this, this slide does it a lot easier. If you look on the left, left the, uh, you have the Canadian, she the Canadian shield, the, the Brazilian shield with the basins, um, the Paraná, uh, is the one I've worked in before looking for oil. Um, but you see that that's a very simplified view of the geology. On the right, you see a more detailed geologic map with the big black dot in the area of our interest. And the first thing you'll notice is that it's pretty much in the center of the continent. And in reality, it is exactly in the center of the continent. Um, if you're in that black dot, you can't go in any direction without going towards the coast. You're going away from the center. Uh, so it happens to be exactly in the middle of the continent. Um, you can skip right over this. So in brief, um, the geology is, is, has a lot of the column missing. You have the, the Precambrian, uh, the Cuyaba group it's called, which is uh, phyllites and metamorph metamorphic uh, plays and things followed by an ice age, uh, there's glacial till, uh, then the uh, marine uh, flooding uh, in the Devonian, uh, which produced the furnace formation, which we'll talk about. Then there was a, a shifting sands with um, cross bedding in the Jurassic, the Botu Katu formation, uh, followed by in the Cretaceous, also in the Botu Katu formation, uh, a jungle environment. And then that was followed by the Andes rising up, which formed uh, this uplift and the uh, escarpment that we're going to be looking at, which is called a chapada. So chapada means escarpment. So when we talk about the geology of chapada dos Guimarães, it means the escarpment of those Guimarães. But the first thing you'll notice is that most, there's very little rock left of all of this time period. The other thing we want to, I want to point now is that uh, the state that we're looking at, Mato Grosso, is the size of Texas. So not a small area. Uh, so when we talk about, you know, going from one place to another within it or something's close and it's in the Mato Grosso, it's a, it, we're talking about hundreds of miles. So here's the stratigraphic column. You have the, oops, I moved my mouse. Uh, you have the furnace formation down here. Uh, um, which is the Devonian and the Ponta Grossa will as well. It's sandstones. And below that in the Precambrian, there's uh, the metamorphics of the Cuyabá group, which doesn't show up in this section. And then all of this is missing in this, this area uh, from this until you get up to the um, Jurassic and there's the Boto Kaptu uh, in the upper draft which is a cross bedded sandstone. And then above that, in the, in the early Cretaceous, there's more of that formation, uh, which is things get a little bit, a little wetter uh, after all the, the shifting sand. So looking at Chapada to give you an idea again, here's the, the Cuyaba group. That's the metamorphic section. Then there's the escarpment coming through here. And then, and the brown is the uh, furnace uh, formation, and the blue is Botucatu up in here. Uh, it shows a lot of folding. Uh, that's almost all in the Precambrian, and there's some minor folding uh, up in the sediments, which uh, didn't have any good pictures of any folding going on there. It's like as you drive towards it, it's uh. A pretty massive cliff ahead of you, and the road comes up. You come up and work your way around uh, through a very narrow, narrow place here, where the the road goes uh, right along the edge of the cliff. And that's called the Porton del Inferno, which means the gates of hell. 
So that gives you an idea of what people thought about when, it got, when you arrived there. And then the road continues back here past a little school called Budi Ti, and then on to Shapada Dos Kimarines. There's a little village over here. But all along here is the escarpment we're talking about, and that's all furnace, Devonian uh, sandstones, and the uh, Jurassic sandstones, and, it, and underneath that is Cambrian. In topography, it, it looks something like this. Here's the apartment we're talking about. Here's the Precambrian. Here's the uh, Devonian dipping and the Jurassic dipping. And this gives you an idea of the topography along here. It actually goes up and then down again. Uh, so it's like a big hump right there at the end edge. One of the interesting things they have is what they call sandstone karst because you have uh, erosion of uh, layers within the sandstone. Uh, in the Devonian forming caves. And these caves uh, are pretty pretty big. You can you know, walk in them and everything. And there's a lot of uh, archeological um, uh, evidence that people lived there for a long time. And one of the more famous ones within the national park around there is called Casa de Pedro, which means the stone, stone house. Uh, and you can see that it looks like, you know, there was a, quite a big, bit of space that had been uh, eroded out. This, uh, well, one more thing about that. In the, just uh, below that, in the Ordovician sandstone, there's some Scolithus tubes. And that caught my eye because, you know, I think of Scolithus, I think of Chickie's Rock. So it's interesting to think that they were down on there as well. One thing I'll point out is that with, you know, one of the wonders of GIS is you can throw any data on top of any other data. So here's the geologic map which shows that the Devonian comes down here and it goes across all the geomorphology to make a peninsula out here and completely misses the uh, Mesa uh, San Geronimo, that's what Moro means, this is Mesa, and which is actually made out of uh, uh, furnace formation, I know. So basically it's a mismatch of scale and accuracy and so you just can't believe everything you see in GIS. This is what the San Geronimo looks like. It's the Devonian uh, sandstone, nice flat uh, rocks, big mesa. Um, here's a little path that you walk to to get to it. And we're gonna talk a lot about that as we go on. Uh, the path that you walk along has a lot of remnants, erosional, erosional remnants, remnants there. This is a photo from the 30s. And I tried to find the same place. And the best I could find was this, which is, I'm not convinced it's exactly the same feature, but this is uh, Stone Geronimo in the background, and here would be the place. Um, I think it was taken from over here on to the right. Um, but other things that you find here, these odd uh, remnants here, uh, it's called the, the the sacrificial altar and the the totem of uh, stone um, that you know are pretty amazingly sticking up out of the, the brush. The brush is called the salado, which means uh, just dry brush. Um, you also find uh, brachiopods in the formation above the furnace, the Ponte Grossa. Um, so here's some brachiopods. They're not anything to get too excited about, but it does show that it's marine. And then you go up into the Boto Cactu, which is the Jurassic, and you have the Aeolian lots of cross bedding. It's a lot like uh, the Navajo sandstone that we think of dramatic and big massive cliffs um, and some pretty interesting artifacts as you go around and see the the cross bedding and some of the elements um, pretty distinctive and what they call a uh, runiform which I had never heard before but a runiform means that runes because you have jointing and polygons and cross bedding intersecting so you get a lot of lines going across each other and then and I'm going to display my ignorance here. This, either at the top of the Devonian, because I can't be sure, or the bottom of the, the um, Jurassic, and it's a set of sediment, and I don't know what it is. I, I just don't know what it is. It looks like little mounds coming up. So any of you who actually know geology can tell me what it is uh, maybe when we're done here. Um, in the upper Botokatu, after you get out of the, the shifting sands, you into the more uh, wet climate 
and there's actually some dinosaur fossils, um, which are uh, about 70 million years old, you know, the Cretaceous. Um, and they were found just to the north of um, Chapada, the, that village. Um, so that's, pre that's pretty exciting because you don't often find dinosaur fossils in, uh, um, you know, most of the places I have things. <laughs> um, going back to the geologic map again, we're talking about the fossils being found like right up in here in the Boat of the Katu, uh, and here's Chapada. And here's the road that goes along in the Porto, Porto de Inferno right there. And that big uh, waterfall is right here, Vail de Noiva. So the other thing this area is known for are the mineral resources. Uh, all of Brazil has, has just plenty of gemstones floating about. It seems like they just have um, incredible deposits. But this area in particular has a lot of diamonds. Um, so this is a place I stopped in there selling diamonds uh, in this little rusty tin. Um, they were first discovered in 1746 in the, uh, in the alluvium. And it was, at first they were used as markers in card games because they didn't know what they were. They just were pretty rocks. So they used them you know, to keep track of things. Um, they're found in potholes in the river and they used to sluice the pebbles and then hand sort them. When they found one, they would you know, give it to one of their captors who would then put it in a gamella. This is what a gamella is, which is a big wooden tray. Uh, they're usually about a foot and a half or more uh, wide. Um, so you're talking about all diamonds <laughs> that they were picking up. Um, the kimberlites are found along a trend like this going through the continent. I mean, they're scattered everywhere else too, but there's a nice trend here. Um, in just Mato Grosso, they, there's a big cluster of them up in, in the northeast of where we're looking. This is the area that we're talking about. And so all the sediments below that carry lots of diamonds in the sediments in, in any of the streams. Uh, there's a theory that there's a, a lineament that goes uh, along here that, that is where you have the kimberlites. What I particularly like about this is it's a very wide kimberlite and it actually, you know, very wide lineament and it actually bends, which makes it even more exciting. And I also like it because it can, it's, uh, you know, I wrote my master's thesis on just this very idea. So I kind of like it. Uh, this is what it looks like in uh, Chapada. This is what a diamond mine looks like. They just have a lot of sediment and somebody has to go through it and, and, and uh, sift through all that dirt and, and look for the diamonds. Um, it's easier than blasting rock, <laughs> but it's still a pretty uh, gruesome job. Um, there's also a lot of alluvial gold. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot of it. There's just a lot of gold everywhere you go. Every stream has gold in it. Every Anywhere there's alluvium, you have gold. Um, so there's, with both of them, you have both the modern sediments and you have um, ancient sediments sediments, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so there can be a lot of a lot of mining. The area that we're interested in is, again, as I pointed out, in the center of the continent, and it's actually in the, at the headwaters of both the uh, Amazon and the Paraguay river systems and the Xingu river system. So it's three, uh, three directions you can go with a drop of water there. Um, this area is, has had a number of indigenous uh, peoples who live there. This is unfortunately the only the only uh, map I could find of it, uh, which has no other information on it to show you how it relates to today's geography. But believe me, this is the area we're looking at. Um, and so it's really only useful to us in the sense that it gives you the names of some of the, the tribes. And I also would point out that uh, obviously these orders are completely uh, inferred by a lot of, you know, what somebody thought it might be uh, uh, and uh, pushed around a lot. So these borders really don't mean much of anything, I don't think, in, in the modern day. But um, the, the, the area that we're interested in was mainly Bororo Indians. And above that were the Bacarai. Uh, and 
to the one side of the Kaya pole and the Nambiquara up here. And we'll talk about each one of those. Uh, and the, we'll take a look here at what usually you would find is like, like a circular village. And if you look in uh, air photos and LIDAR in the Amazon, you can find these circular features where there were extensive villages um, that have topographic evidence that they were created by man. And then um, you often find Altera Petra, which is black earth associated with pre-Columbian civilizations. This is a normal lateritic. And then this is the, the dirt you find where there's been people living there for hundreds or thousands of years. In the area that we're talking about, and this is near Booty T right here, this area was said to be a uh, very fertile and abnormally uh, dark soil. So that's a possible indicator that there was Indian uh, occupancy there. This is called the Kushipal River that coming through here. And then there was a lot of circular things that I saw on air photos. Uh, through here, and I can see I can see circulars where there are none, uh, um, as Kent would probably attest. Uh, so I wouldn't put too much weight on the the idea that there really are circulars there. But if you were to do an archaeological dig, this is where I would start. I would say that there's probably some evidence of something here uh, over long term, and then these areas here may be places where people had lived. And one reason you might is that these are springs that are bringing water through. So if you want Wanted to have a village next to a spring, it would be a perfect location uh, to have it both be dry, not, not swampy, and yet close to the water source. So the first Indian tribe we're going to look at is the Bororo. <clears throat> They're a very large uh, group. They are studied by Levi Strauss, who's a famous anthropologist. Um, there's a subgroup of them who lived along the Kushipal River called the Kushipal. Uh, which means arrow fishing. And here is a drawing of a Kushipaw Indian with his bow and arrow and these long, long arrows that they would shoot into the river and get fish. Um, the Bororo have a, a long history of conflict with settlers um, and being uh, decimated. The Jingu, who live on, in the Jingu River system, which I showed you there, uh, <clears throat> have also had a, a lot of conflict with the Westerners. And they created a refuge for them in 1961. So the Jingu River has an area where that's devoted just to them. And uh, there's always a constant battle trying to keep them from being run over by people coming in to take their land. But a subgroup of the Jingu are the Kayapo. And the Kayapo are, are known especially for their, their war clubs. Uh, they would carry these clubs like this and just just wallop people with them and, and kill them uh, and rather than the bow and arrow. So it was a pretty uh, distinctive weapon uh, for one particular tribe. Other tribes don't seem to carry that same weapon. The Nambiquara, which we talked, they're up in the northwest, uh, have, usually have a pierced ear or nose. Levi Strauss also called, studied them as well. They also had conflicts with missionaries in West Pierce in the 20s. Um, their numbers greatly reduced. And the Chavante were enslaved in the 1800s. Uh, and when they had a chance, they melted back into the forest as much as they could to avoid detection. But then they were rediscovered in the 1930s uh, as an unknown tribe that had re-emerged in people's eyes. Uh, obviously, they had always been there, so they need to be discovered again. Uh, uh, the Bakarai, uh, which were to the north of uh, Chavante, call themselves Kura, which means human beings, uh, as in they're the true human beings and all others are just subgroups of human beings. Um, they, I actually met a Barakai uh, Indian once and bought a bow and arrow from him. Uh, this is the bow and arrow I bought with my pick for scale. And this is that drawing we showed of the Kaya, uh, Kushipaw Indian with his bow and arrow for, for fishing in the, in the river. Here's the bow, and you can see the arrow with these long uh, points on it. And this is the kind of point that they make. It's made out of one piece of wood that they carve. Uh, so it's not a metal or wood, I mean, metal or stone point. It's a wooden point. And it's about a six foot uh, bow, excuse me. But in all that time, uh, this drawing was made in 1823, and this was 
2006, and they have changed very, very little in all that time. So in 1494, Spain and Portugal split up North South America without knowing how big it was. Uh, if you look at this map, here's Africa. They drew a line and they said, well, we know there's, there's South America comes around here a little bit and there's some on the north, but they had no idea what happened on, on the west side or how south it went. So they divided up the whole continent without even knowing who was getting what, which is pretty amazing to me. Uh, it took another 200 years for Europe to reach Monte Grosso, which is about a thousand miles inland. The 1718, uh, a guy named Campos um, came from Sao Paulo to Cuiabá in order to, to enslave Indians. And uh, that's because African slaves were, were too expensive and they could get Indians a lot of cheaper. Uh, and so they would come into the center of the continent looking for Indians to enslave. Um, while he was hanging around Cuyabá, which was not yet a city, but that's the area that he was at, he noticed the river bank was just littered with gold. And so he quickly turned from good doing slavery to, to gold mining. But to do that, he needed slaves. So he just captured a lot of, of Indians and made them collect gold for him. Um, as it says here, when word got back to Sao Paulo, more people came up, but it's a six month trip. Um, the 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 powers that be back in Portugal, who owned that part of Brazil, said that uh, they didn't want people wasting their time farming, so that you could only look for gold if you were going inland, and you had to buy all your food and stuff from government. Uh, so waste your time farming when you could be out, out getting gold. So three years later, uh, Van der Ponte, excuse me, I don't really know if I'm saying that right. Um, Miguel Sutil had uh, Indian slaves, slaves looking for honey for him when he found that if he just pulled up a clump of grass, the dirt and the roots were, were mixed with gold. And then that's where the town of Cuyaba is now located. Um, so there was this gold, not just, you know, in, in the river that you had to pan for, you would actually see gold just pulling up a plant. Um, notice the composition of this painting. He's has all the native peoples in the back doing all the, the gold uh, exploration work in the stream, and he's standing there with a gun. Uh, so that was pretty much the, the setup. You had these, these guys who came up um, from Sao Paulo and uh, would in, in enslave a bunch of people and then uh, have them look for gold for them. So this didn't go over well with the indigenous people, the Kayapo and other tribes uh, would attack them. Uh, it's told that there are groups of up to 500 Europeans would be, be attacked by and as they traveled and be killed. That's a pretty large group of people to have been. Uh, they then throw all the gold back in the river. But it led to a lot of over uh, uh, 100 or 200 years. The queen. As I mentioned, wanted to have people focus. She prohibited uh, farming, and uh, the local people realized that they were thousands of miles away from her, so they didn't really care. Um, but she sent some people to collect taxes, and they in turn sent a chest of gold to her. But when they op opened it back in Portugal, they found it just had ordinary rocks in it, which I suspect were probably from the Cuyaba group. Or so like, um, in 1720, a guy named uh, Antonio Lara went up the escarpment towards Chapada, uh, saying he was going to hunt. That was his excuse for going. Other people said he was also going to look for gold. Both of legitimate reasons for he was going to scout a farm location, which was an illegal activity. You can see that he, here's Cuyabo, went across flat, and then you go up this steep escarpment. Come out right about here, which is where Buriti is, and then you'd have to go over here to get to Shapada. So he came out approximately where he he decided to to uh, in Buriti. Um, he called it Buriti Monjolino. Monjolino is a little stream on the property. Uh, he went to start growing sugarcane, but he needed sugar sugar seedlings to do that. And it took six months by canoe to go down the river, get them, and come back again. And that was used to make uh, kasha, uh, 
I'm going to say it wrong. So there we go. Kashasa uh, as a form of rum. Um, it was said that mill was of great use to the population, greatly from the plagues and malaria that plagued the region. Uniti Kasasha has served to alleviate the suffering. Uh, it was a very unpleasant place to be. Uh, uh, here's another quote. People who had a dead face stopped having it after the emergence of emergence of Guti Kasasha. So, so in the 1700s, it, it was such an unpleasant place to be, both with the the conflict, the heat, the bugs, the animals, that uh, people were in desperate need of uh, a form of rum <laughs> to survive there. And uh, Guti Tea brand became pretty popular as a result. Uh, the heat is something that people still comment upon. And there's an, a joke that goes around that people who live in Cuyabaga go to hell for vacation to cool off. So why is it called booty tea? It's a palm tree. Uh, they have oil, planta oil plantations and it's found along water sources. So it's a good indicator plant. Uh, this is the kind of fruit it bears in it. It has loads of carotene uh, and it grows in a nice hot climate which is good. And so it was called Fazenda, which means farm booty tea. Uh, this is a painting, oops, did it again. This is a painting uh, from the 30s of the booty tea palm there. This is a picture with the fruit hanging down. So that place that we're talking about is right in here. And here's the Cuxipal River. Uh, the X is pronounced as a in Brazil, in the Portuguese. So the Cuxipal comes like this. And over to that uh, big waterfall, here's the Monjolino with the springs coming around like this. And this is the area where Laura started his farm in the 1720s. All the farming was predicated on slavery. Um, and the Fazendas usually had 30 to 200 slaves. This shows them using animal power to uh, crush the sugar cane to get the juices out to make the kazasha. Uh, this is a painting of what someone in modern day thought the booty tea would have looked like. They have human beings running the press to squeeze the sugar cane uh, under an open canopy like this. Um, in reality, it looked more like this. It was a two-story building with a big water wheel and a, an actual engine that crushed the sugar cane. Uh, so it's a much bigger production. The Kasha, 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 I can say it. Kasha, 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 excuse me, was made directly from sugar cane, whereas rum is made from molasses. Uh, and if you take the sugar cane without removing the molasses, you form these bricks of brown sugar called a rapadura. It's huge copper kettles filled with bubbling brown sugar that would be formed into bricks, and then that would be made it into Kasha. The first map I could find that showed booty tea was from 1760. And down here is Cuyaba. And up here it is a blur. But if you zoom in on it, you can see very blurry. Uh, sorry, very blurry booty tea written right here. And that's that's where it's located. So it was on the map in 1760. <clears throat> Early traders um, were would come up from Cuyaba over oh man, my uh, every time I use my mouse, I'm, I'm messing up my uh, advancement here. It'd come from Cuyaba up through the uh, escarpment and up to through by Casa de Pedra and then up to Budi Tea. And these are the different routes that people would take during that time period. These were mapped by a guy named uh, Nolm Saltzstein, who is a a really great eco guide in the area who knows everything about the local history. So that's what happened up until the 1700s, and then uh, I don't have any information for a while. The next thing I found was 1818. There's a Fazenda Budi Tea that is described in some tax information that says that they had a cane mill, a flour mill, a gold mine, one blacksmith, 200 slaves, and in the two story building where the mill was, they had. Uh, a dining and reception area and a kitchen and the living quarters upstairs. I can't be absolutely sure this is 
is the booty tee that I'm looking at, but that's exactly the description that someone uh, about 10 years later came by and said this is what it looked like. So the descriptions matched very nicely. And the guy who came later was a guy named Langsdorf. He was a Russian explorer. In 1823, he came all the way from Sao Paulo around up to the mouth of the Amazon, going by Cuyaba. And while, while he was in Cuyaba, my goodness, while he was in Cuyaba, he made a little side trip up to Chapada. So that little, little line there is his description going up there. And just as an aside, this is Diamantino, which is diamond area up here, which is right along the route. Just gives you an idea how diamonds were so prevalent. So this is his route. And he went up like this. What's interesting is that this is quite a feat because Teddy Roosevelt uh, attempted something very similar a uh, hundred years later and just barely made it without dying. Um, so it's pretty amazing that these guys did it with uh, the te technology they had. Along with him was an artist and inventor named uh, Florence. And he invented multicolor mimeograph and he invented photography uh, and musical notation for bird songs, uh, but nobody really knows about him because he lived in Campinas, Brazil and didn't get any PR. But everywhere they would go, he would draw or paint what they saw. So he went to Fazenda Buriti, and what you see here is over on the right, an open thatch building that would be a place where you could get work done. And then Buriti Palms, which means that we're standing very close to the water, which would be the Cushipal River. And then right above this horse here are two, three buildings going along like that. So there's the buildings. And this is a painting in 1930. Um, oh, let me see here. Or is somebody trying to call me? <laughs> Sorry. Um, my mistake again. Sorry. So that was 1930 in the 1940s. The building was still there. 1980 is still there. And today, one of those three buildings is still in existence there. So they were slave quarters um, where people lived. The other thing you notice when you look at the, the next drawing he did was they had a huge flume for water coming in and a two story building. This is where the uh, mill was. And um, this is where um, you would have the kitchen on the first floor and dining room and the living quarters upstairs and a very nice patio, I mean, a porch up above where you'd be above the bugs and you could just sit in the shade and look out. Now, most interesting to me about this picture is um, that in the front of the building, the owner, who is a woman named Antonia, you know, uh, would lay in a hammock and smoke and direct activity of the slaves. And if you look at the picture, there are slaves carrying her on a, a slung hammock uh, where she had come from Cuyaba, which was 26 miles away, up the escarpment that was 200 feet high. And she lay in the hammock while they carried her the whole distance up and over to come up here. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, this is where their flume of water came from. Here's the, the spring, and the flume came over this direction and would and then hit the mill, which would have been there. And it's a fall of about 100 feet. So again, there would be the flume carrying the water in, and there's the mill. There she is in her, her hammock. And today, this would be where the flume would have been. This would have been where the mill was. Here's where the slave quarters are, and one of the buildings is still there. Here's the Cushipal River, which had the booty tea palms on it, as you could tell. The Cushipal comes along like this and then falls over the cliff here at Villanueva. So Florence drew some of the local rocks while he was there, mainly the furnace formation. Uh, here's some of his drawings. Here's some of the rocks. And Here's those, those rocks we talked about before, which if you remember, let me go back one, 
one here. Oops. If you look over here, he caught some of those right here. Um, and then this created rumors of, of uh, an ancient Amazonian city, the city of Z, because it looked like columns left over from a, a um, uh, ancient civilization. And you can see the same thing in the Botucatu formation as well, so that people would see this from a distance, say, look at those, those uh, ruins. He had one last task to do before he left. He went westward to see the Waterfall of Hell, which is now called the Vale de Nueva, which is the Bridal Veil. So it's changed the name from Waterfall of Hell to Bridal Veil. Somebody did some PR work there. Uh, he said it was 200 feet high. It's 225, so that's a pretty good guess. And he painted it from the east side, and all the viewing today is from the west. But you can see um, he did a, a very good job of capturing it, of the water coming over the Botsukatu um, formation. Again, I now lose track of time. Nothing much happens that I can find from 1823 to about 1870 when soldiers returning from the Paraguay War brought uh, smallpox, killing a third of the population. And then in the early 1880s, Her Herbert Huntington Smith uh, came. He's a naturalist with his wife Daisy, and he would go through the woods and shoot specimens all day and write some scraps on his paper and, and stuff in his pocket and Daisy would transcribe them and then stuff all the specimens. Daisy did all the work essentially and Smith got all the credit um, and he set up shop in Shapada. He would start every day by walking along the Kushipal River and the first waterfall he came to is called a Nom, nom which is a uh, dwarf uh, in some cases or it could just be a form of Inyo which is mean small. In either case it's, it's a small waterfall which indeed it is a small waterfall. But every time he starts his excursions, he talks about his first stop being at this waterfall. And then he would walk along the Kushipal River, shooting everything that lived uh, and putting it in a bag and bringing it back for uh, stuffing. Um, at times, he would get tired of all that and stop for a drink at the Fazenda Budi Tea. Up on that upper porch that we saw, he would have refreshments on the porch there, and I'm sure the refreshments were mainly kasasha or, um, or coffee. Smith uh, got in a little bit of trouble because he promised a lot of specimens to a lot of museums, uh, both in the States and in Brazil, and, and nobody came out of it feeling like they got what they had hoped to get. Um, there's a monument to the state geologist of Alabama uh, and uh, Smith Hall. Um, and the phrase, which had been destroyed by federal troops, is, is all through uh, Alabama, I found when I was down there. Um, um, and so it made it a little bit difficult for me to use the library in a joking way. Um, but he died because he was deaf. And while walking, walking to work, he was hit by a freight train. Here's the Alabama Museum of Natural History. And here's where the trains, freight train went through uh, in the 1800s and he was killed in Tuscaloosa. But his diaries were stored in a shoebox in the Alabama Geological Survey. And as an undergrad, I spent the summer rerouting garbage trucks so they had equal loads of garbage. And after work, I'd visit the library and I discovered his manuscripts. Uh, and this is a page from one of his manuscripts telling he talks about the weather, how many butterflies he saw, and how many things he, he shot and things like that. In 1888, everything fell apart because uh, slavery ended and 90% of the population left. You could understand if you were a slave, it wasn't a great place to be. It had a lot of bad memories and bad climate and bad working conditions. The white owners uh, didn't want to do the work themselves and so much of the land sat vacant. That led to 1920 when Philip Landis arrived. Uh, he was a, an evangelist who rode a horse between villages in central Brazil. He had three sermons and he would stay long enough to use his three sermons and then he'd move on again. Um, there were bandits, uh, indigenous people, uh, wild animals. It was a pretty uh, wild place, uh, uh, similar to the U.S. West in the 1800s. But he purchased Fazenda Budi Tea for the Presbyterian Church. The local people were resentful, saying that they, they 
they stole it basically. They paid nothing for it. And indeed, they paid $29,000 in today's dollars. Uh, they only wanted the two slave buildings, but the owner said that they had to buy all 24 square miles along with it, or there was no deal. So that comes out to um, 12, they paid 12 cents per acre back then for it, or $17.90 per acre um, for 24 square miles. Uh, this is where it was located. You can see all the other Presbyterian facilities are all located on the coast. And this is way inland. Um, the two slave quarters had a whipping pole uh, in, the, in the center, which would have been around here. And, and then the, uh, the mill, the mill was picked over, so all was left was the, the foundation. And the foundation was composed of Brazilian pepperwood, uh, which is a particularly nasty kind of wood. It, the, the fruit paralyzes birds, and the sap causes something like poison ivy. And if you burn it, it uh, it's like having mace in your face. It's illegal to grow it in the United States. But the logs had not rotted, and they were reused. This is a, a post similar to the one that was found in front of those slave buildings. This is in an urban area. Um, Edith Moser, who had started this at the school that they started there, um, had it removed. I'm, I'm guessing that the wood was called Jataba instead of the uh, pepperwood because that would have just been too difficult to lean against. But the Jataba is a extremely hard rock resistant wood with large pods and the pods have a really sticky pulp inside that's very nutrient rich. It has protein and starch. Uh, Indian indigenous people use it for their major nutrition source. And I like this phrase, those, those who eat it do not consider the odor unpleasant. Uh, so this was the school in 1923. Homer and Edith Moser started the school in the two slave quarters. They had four students. Um, 1925, a, a New Yorker named Wheeler came to uh, see what they were up to. It took them four days by train and 10 days by boat to get to Cuyaba. Uh, uh, sometimes averaging four miles per hour. And when he got there, he said, Cuyaba is a terror of a place to reach. From Cuyaba, he wanted to get up to Buditi, so he walked seven miles, uh, drove, spent the night, walked another five miles, spent six hours looking for mules that were roaming around, got one, rode four more hours, and arrived at Buditi a day and a half later, having gone on 26 miles. Uh, so travel was was difficult. Um, here he mentions that uh, he stopped an Indian hut and had Indian hospitality, and Landis preached to, to a dozen or more Indians. So that's the Landis who bought the property. The next famous person to come through was Percy Fawcett, who was an explorer, and he had to, uh, a big expedition to go there. He'd been to other parts of uh, South America and was relatively famous. But he passed through Buditi on his way to Dead Horse Camp, where he disappeared and was presumably killed by the Xingu Indians. He had read a manuscript called Manuscript 512 in the Brazilian National Library, which said that there was a lost city in the Amazon. And, and he called it the City of Z, and he was going to find it. Um, he also was buddies with Arthur Conan Doyle, who, who wrote a story called The Lost World about dinosaurs found on a remote plateau, which sounds a lot like uh, Monte Grosso, but in, actually it's from another, another part of of, uh, South America. This is the route he took. He went from, oops, well, we can go right here. He went from Cuyaba up through Buriti and over to the Bacarai uh, post where the Indians were, and up here and over to where he ran into the Xingu and was killed. Uh, there's a movie of it called um, The Lost City of Z that has Tom Holland and Sienna Miller, if you want to see it. It's kind of entertaining. Um, Fawcett, upon leaving Cuyaba and heading towards Moody T, uh, someone wrote about it and said, um, he watched the march northward into a world so far completely uncivilized and unknown by people. So he's going from Cuyaba up towards Moody T into a world so far completely uncivilized and unknown by pe people. And I would just say that other than the school and the Wheeler guy and the other people who live there and the numerous indigenous tribes had already been there for years. So 
they went on to say, who knows what unknown tribes live in the base of this waterfall. So here again is Vail Nueva. Here's the valley going out. It does look pretty remote, uh, but as we'll see, it was, it was actually uh, part of the whole farm that uh, had been bought by the Presbyterians for the school. So where did the water from the school come from? The plantation used the trestle to bring water in from the Mojolino Spring directly to the mill. There is no trestle there today that does that. This would have been in where the trestle was. Instead, there was a trench that brought water around in a curve like this that was dug by slaves in the previous century. And they reopened that trench, had it come over and fill up a reservoir here, which here's the reservoir. And then that little reservoir of water was used to drive a generator. Uh, and then this is a 1930s painting, and you can see very poorly, but there's these occasional posts along here, which are telephone uh, wire posts. They had electrical wires going. So the whole place is electrified based on that one little pond. So the Montalino is a small, just a small stream. When I asked local people to guide me, uh, they refused saying it was prime in Sucuri territory, which a Sucuri is an anaconda, which is known to reach 30 feet. Uh, here's a here's a sukuri in the wild or the, the civilian area. This is a, a very small one that I brought back in my, uh, from Brazil. This is the skin uh, in my backyard. Um, I, yeah, I realize that I'm out of time here, so I'm just going to skip ahead and say there were some some, uh, some places that they would go. One was the Vila Nova. This is a very old Old, old movie. Ah, come on. Old, old movie. And I don't know if you can see it. But this is the place where they said, who knows what tribes live there. Here's some people. This is from the 30s. And there's the waterfall. And they're at the base of the waterfall swimming. Um, and you can see a little bit of just how, how big it was. All to say that it was uh, it was considered, you know, people would say, gee, it's you know completely unknown, and yet people were swimming there for for fun. Um, they would sometimes hike out to the top of this San Geronimo, and sometimes they would swim in places like this, which is the Otu Katu formation, um, right along the top there. Um, all kinds of interesting. I'm not going to go into it, but there's some interesting. Bugs that can get into your system if you uh, swim in there too. Um, let's skip right over that. Here's some bridges that you would drive along two logs that have been carved a little bit so your tire stuck in the groove to get across. And then this the Porton de Inferno, uh, which is at the, the contacts of the furnace and the Bota du Katu formations. And it was a, a pretty wild place to be. Um, Again, this is a, an old movie of uh, a truck trying to make it up that that place. And then once they'd, they'd get up, they uh, would load it up with all the material that had been in it. And everybody would get back in the car and, and move on again. So in, by 1970, they had the first paved road that replaced this, this uh, Porton de Inferno. And since then, it's been a number of things. Uh, there was going to be a commune there. There's a technical school there. Today, it's largely abandoned. Uh, and mainly what's there are the two making money makers are water and the national park. There's a company called Brambina, which has wonderful water. The source is right outside of Chapada. Um, it's very close to where he started his, uh, his walks with that little waterfall. Uh, um, and then tourism is the national park. Uh, the whole area has been declared a national park because of the waterfalls. And um, it's called a, a mecca of uh, ecotourism today. It's also the geographic center of South America. Uh, in Cuyaba, this is where, where it, it was. And they made a bigger monument. Uh, but in reality, it's located up by Chapada. And um, it's pretty nondescript. You just go out into a field, there's a little marker there that says here at the center. Um, 
kind of the, some of the oddities happening right now is that there's a a lot of discussion about it being an electromagnetic corridor for a perfect civilization to be born, or that it's an entryway to the hollow Earth uh, in Machu Picchu. So it draws a lot of wild uh, theories from people. Uh, there's a military base there. And so people think, well, if there's a base, they must be doing something. Uh, uh, so they think that there's a lot of UFO activity and that UFOs land on top of San Geronimo. Here's the, uh, the route to San Geronimo from the road. You, it's a six to eight hour round trip uh, to get there. You can't go without a, uh, a guide. And it's uh, pretty physically demanding. And, and I like that they say, are there facilities? And they say, no, no, meaning there's nothing. Um, so going back to that formation here, this is the, this would be on that road. You can see, see that it's pretty desolate. Um, but here is my mother. And here I, I picked up just recently. I noticed that this guy is in his bare feet walking uh, a trail that is really pretty a, a strenuous uh, hike across rock and uh, a lot of unpleasant uh, bugs and animals uh, and, and uh, for many hours uh, to get up there. So uh, one of the rocks that I have from there is this. Uh, it, it turns out it was used by my mother to crack chicken bones and extract their marrow. And I had I asked Steve Shank to do XRF, and all I saw was chicken fat. But when he cleaned it, he found it to be hornfells, and there's no hornfells anywhere around there. But there is hornfells right in here, which drains over to here, which is 14 miles from Cuyaba. So it's conceivable that they picked it up there, or they knew somebody who had it, and that's where it came from. Um, so I think I'm I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to go straight ahead to. Do you have any questions? Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Ken. I guess, uh, Jay, could, could you quickly uh, summarize how you got involved in here? In this, uh, obviously, your mother's been there. Uh, your your anthropology lesson here was interesting, but uh, I wondered how you got snagged. Well, in remember I said. Uh, well, I remember I said that the. Uh, um, Homer and Edith Moser started a school. Yeah. So my mother was Ruth Moser, their daughter. Okay. okay. So my mother grew up there. All right. And so well, I've been I've been there three times as, since then. Okay. Cool. So Jay, I don't know if you can see the chat. If if not, I, I can read you something. Uh, Tom Whitfield wants to know. So uh, how hot is it? He wants to know how hot <laughs> it is. It's very hot. Uh, it's often in the 80s in the in the coldest time and hundreds um, in the hotter time. However, uh, up above, up on top of the escarpment, it's 10 degrees cooler than below. Probably and that's one of the draws as a tourist uh, uh, locality. I'm looking for my notes. I have another question. Okay. What What do you yeah. think the sort the soils that indicate civilization, dark soils? What's that from? Uh, fires or sewage or or what? Well, I my my first thought is always sewage. I figure yeah. if you have people living somewhere for yeah. hundreds of years, you're going to have an effect. That's right. And they aren't walking two miles down the road, <laughs> they're sticking close to home. Yep. So that's my theory. Yep. Uh, ben Greeley asked, was my grandmother a Presbyterian missionary? And my grandparents were, yes. So yeah. they, um, my grandfather was Mennonite, but they became Presbyterian missionaries. Rick. No? Maybe not. Jay, do you see that? Uh, yes, the biota on the miscarpment. Yeah, uh, on 
and on and below the escarpment is very, very different. Um, well, I, I shouldn't say that, not, not entirely. There's more water above, and so there's a lot more diversity and a lot of, uh, like even today, there's just a lot of publications about exotic species being discovered there. Uh, like there's a variety of bat that's found nowhere else in the world or something. Um, it's all discovered in this one little area because there's there's a lot of water and and it's hot. If you go down below, it's just hot and there's not much water. You don't have the the same number of springs and, and easy access to water. The cave erosion smalling or running water. I think it's smalling. Although there, there, there was one I saw that did have running water, so I, I can't really say for sure. And unfortunately, when you try to read about these things, it's all filled with tourist, uh, you know, write-ups about, you know, nothing about what actually happened, but how it looks instead. Hey, Jay, is there a time of year that it's better to visit than others? It almost looks like a tropical savanna climate. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's below the equator, so you want to go in our summertime, which is their winter. Yeah, and, and then it'll be a little wet season. Or or it'll be 70s and 80s. Do they have a dry season and wet season? Uh, yes, there is, but it's, it's not. Uh, not terribly pronounced. Um, Greg asked about it's just still gold mining area. There's loads of gold mining. Uh, it's not at all, all unusual when I was there to, to be in Cuyabon, run into somebody and they would just haul out a bag of gold dust that they had recently uh, dug up, you know, and it had just come into town to cash it in. Um, people walk around with bags of gold all the time. Uh, it's just, there's this gold everywhere. Uh, the uplift was the Andes, uh, so it would be subduction in the Pacific. Um, is I think what Ben was asking. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Let's, let's I, I, I but, left out some of this. They're a little bit more gruesome. <laughs> All right, uh, Jay, we have uh, um, Bill Roman has a question. Contact right between Jurassic. Is that where we saw that strange um, lines that are down here? So, Jay, I don't know if you could hear that. It, he, he's asking about the contact between the Devonian and the and the Jurassic. Uh, what, what specifically uh, what did you find at the contact? The dimple lithology. The contact between the, the Devonian and, and which? And Jurassic. Jurassic. That, that unidentified feature. The dimple Jurassic. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm not we, hearing. The, well, the jury's still out, right? We don't, you don't know what that is. I don't know what it is. I'm a geophysicist, so, you know, it's not an infinite half space. It's a bumpy half space. <laughs> um the the source of the rock for the gold um there you know as you go into the amazon there's just a lot of uh, mineral deposits and it all just washes down in these streams and well, you find alluvial deposits so there's a lot of alluvial mining and nobody really cares what the original source is so much now that's changed as they get into the Amazon, there's more and more mining of actual deposits in the Amazon, which is what's destroying the Amazon. There's, um, I think, a uh, 1,000 or 870, no, 1,000 some illegal landing strips in Mato Grosso alone. Um, I'll have to spill runways out in the jungle so they can get at the gold. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions here. Uh, thank you, Jay. That was that was thank excellent. You. Um, we really yeah. appreciated it. Uh, and so next month uh, we we have the survey's own Haley Filippelli to talk about 
a modern stratigraphic framework for Pennsylvania. And uh, for those of you here, I want to point out we have uh, guidebooks that we're giving away. So on your way out, uh, take a souvenir. There we go. So Jay, you can uh, you're on screen now, so you can you can wave everyone goodbye. <laughs> Unless you have any. Uh, goodbye, comments. everybody. Thank you. It's good to see, good to see, you. see the survey again. <laughs> yep. Thank you. And uh, meeting is adjourned. See you next month. All right. And if anyone wants to see the feed bulletin, it's pretty tough.